Ren. Thank you, Crystalline. Thank you. Well done. Thank you so much. Have you been blessed today? Amen. Amen. Just to see our young people up here singing. Ah, it's great to be in the house of the Lord today. Let's pray one more time. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, it is such a privilege to have this, this space and this time with you right now. And we pray, Lord, that you, you may speak. And whatever we have planned may not be in the way of the message that you want to get to our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that we may be a little bit disturbed, that we may move towards Jesus as quick as we can. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So today we are in Matthew chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles today, just open them to Matthew chapter 5. A couple of weeks ago, we did the first part of this passage where we talked about salt. We're doing the second part of the passage now. So we're in Matthew chapter 5 in verse 14. That's the passage we're in. We just read it, but keep your finger in there. We're going to be there all day. So it's Matthew chapter 5 verse 14. I want to tell you about uh, a town in Norway. This is in southern Norway. It's up in the mountains. It's very high. It's very beautiful if you go up there. The town is called Ruikan. And I listened on Google how to pronounce that. I still don't think I got it right. Ruikan. It has a J in it. R-J-U-K-N. If someone here is from Norway, please correct me. But this town was founded because there, there's a waterfall right there, and they built a hydroelectric plant there. And so workers started moving out to this town, and pretty soon once you get a worker, then you get a shop, and you get someone who does meals, and you get, uh, there's a fertilizer company that as well. Anyway, a couple of decades down the road, there is a well-established town in Ruiken. The problem is, the town is in such so high in the mountains, but it's in the valley between two mountains, that for six months of the year, there's no sunlight that hits the town. It's not so much that there's no sunlight anywhere, it's just that where the town is, there's no sunlight, there's a shadow. So if you live in that town, you can wake up, look out your window, and about two kilometers down the road, you see sun. The sun's hitting them, but not you for six months out of the year. So the town comes together and they say, we want sunshine. We, we want the light. Is that fair? Can we have a little bit of light? And they take it to their, to their town office over and over again. The big voting, talking item is, why can't we have sunlight? And no one has an answer for this. And about a decade ago, someone said, actually, there's a town that, that was very similar to ours. And, and now they have sunlight. I, what did they do? Well, they, they put a mirror at the top of a mountain, looking at the sun. And, and this mirror reflects the light into the town. Unanimous vote at their meeting. We want that, but we want it even better. And they started building one of the biggest mirrors that we have in the world. And it's not just any mirror. This mirror is controlled by state-of-the-art electronics that follows the sun exactly and does a beam of sunshine right into the town square. Which, by the way, is uh, the beam of sunshine is only about a 10 meter square. It's not that big. But if you go look this up on Google, you will see that at every moment Every day, the citizens of this town are taking turns standing in this square of sunshine. Because, because, once you see the light, once you experience the light, you question why you have to live in darkness at all. And so this really matters. Light really matters. So there's Jesus. He's speaking to his disciples. And as we said a couple weeks ago, Jesus is setting the tone for what the followers of Jesus are going to be like. Jesus is setting the tone for what the communities of Jesus should look like. So he gets to this point where he tells them, you are the salt of the earth. And we said, 
Salt doesn't work at a distance. Salt can't gather in one place. No, salt has to be has to spread around. Salt has to be in contact, power of presence. Salt needs to be in the community. And then he says, you are the light of the world. And he begins the conversation as, we call this the Sermon on the Mount. He begins the conversation, there's a crowd gathered around, he says in verse uh, 14, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And the wording that Jesus is using is on purpose. Because when people hear this, as they're gathered around, they hear, you are the light of the world. And then he mentions that key word, city. You see, those two words would have meant something to them back then. It would have meant this. It would have, it would have instantly said, he's talking about us. And how Jerusalem, we city, is the light of the world. You see, everyone, every Jewish person who, who was in that group, they had been raised with the belief that Jerusalem was to be the light to the nations. That the whole world was going to come out and, and, and gather and, and, and see them and get to know the Lord that way. Just give you a little bit of taste here. Isaiah 2, uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 3. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. Uh, verse 5. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of of the Lord. Isaiah 42 verse 6. I the Lord have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you. will make you a covenant for the people. And a light for the Gentiles. Isaiah 63. Nations will come to your light. And kings to the brightness of your dawn. All these verses are talking about Jerusalem. So you see what Jesus does. Is he gets them on board with what they agree with. They're going, you know what? I, I don't know if I've agreed with this guy before, but what he's saying makes sense. The city on a hill, yes, we are that light. Yes, what Jesus is saying is good, but you know, Jesus starts breaking their model a little bit. Jesus challenges them by, by then giving some context and Jesus is going to tell them, it's not the city. It's not going to be a place. It's going to be you, the people. You, the disciples, are going to be the light of the world. And that would have been the equivalent of fighting words. The entire history of the nation was the light of the world is the city on a hill, and now Jesus is going to start moving away from that. He's going to say, no, no, it's not a place. It's a person. Then he moves on and he says, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So we're going to slow down a little bit, just so we, just so we get the message that Jesus is getting across. Because in the scriptures, light can mean a lot of things. So it has to be something that Jesus is going to mention, that he's making a point about. And his point, his point is very simple. It's, it's, it's this, you ready? Here it is. The purpose of light is to shine. The purpose of light is to shine. That's it. We could actually be done right there. The only thing that Jesus is getting across is that the purpose of light is to shine. And then he begins describing a lamp that they all would have understood. In the typical household, they would have had a, a clay lamp. It had a little hole in the back for a reservoir where you could put oil in it. And then on the other end, you could put a, you could put a wick. It was usually made of flax. And then inside their houses, they had no windows. As soon as the, the sun was out, as soon as it was dark, it was this lamp. That was it. That was the source of light for the whole house. So Jesus is describing this scenario that everybody would have understood. They all would have been going, yes. Light is for shining. Yes. Yes. We get it. We're, we're following along. Yes, yes. This lamp, they, they all would have clued in immediately. Yes. This lamp... We have to put it in the highest part of the house so everybody can see. It doesn't take a lot, by the way, 
to light up a place. And then Jesus says this, this other thing. He says, and by the way, if you cover the light, it won't shine. Is Jesus, like, very complicated? <laughs> light is meant to shine. When you cover the light, it no longer shines. During World War II, uh, during the Blitz of London, this is when the Luftwaffe kept bombing London. The goal of Hitler was to bomb Britain into submission. As soon as the planes started coming over, they started bombing in at night because at night, you can't see the plane, you can't shoot at it. But the strategy for the people below, and there are mandates from the government, they went out, they said, you all have to turn your lights up. Every single light. Not even a candle. If you turned on a candle and you were caught to have a candle on while there was an air raid, you would go to jail. In fact, not only that street lamps were out, if you absolutely had to drive, and this was for emergency vehicles, they would actually have covers that they would put over the headlights. Because light can be seen for miles, even the smallest light. By the way, the government had to change their plans because there were so many accidents that were happening. As ambulances kept running into buildings because they had no light, they couldn't see. That's the nature of light. Okay, we're just, we're building something here. But something, something is missing. Jesus is saying, you, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. But then Jesus also says other things. This is what he says in John chapter 8, verse 12. He says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. How can you be the light of the world, but Jesus also be the light of the world? There's going to be some kind of relationship between this light. Actually, um, the Apostle Paul gives us some more detail, gives us some more nuance as to what's happening here with this, the light of the world and the lesser light of the world. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 6. He says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made His light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. He's telling us the light of the world is Jesus. He's saying the same thing as John is saying. And then it says, but we have this treasure. We're receiving something from this light. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Jesus will say a simple concept. Paul the theologian We'll complicate it a little bit, we'll elaborate a little bit, but he's basically saying, in the, in the face of Christ, in the face of the true light of the world, we are given this. And we display this light, by the way, as jars of clay, as an imperfect way. We do it imperfectly, but we still reflect this light. I just want you to know that um, I don't think adults get to have as fun clothes as kids do. Can we all agree on that? In the middle of the night, uh, the other night we were woken up by, uh, by my son, and he came in, and he was wearing, um, he was wearing uh, one of his pajamas. And this pajama, we like to call it his science pajama. It actually has um, a skeleton on it. But it's glow in the dark. And so he comes into our room, and all I see is a glowing skeleton walking in it. I go, what did I have for supper? But you know, that's the concept that's talking about. Glow in the dark stuff, it doesn't work by itself. It has to receive light from somewhere else and then reflect it. That's it, that's how it works. It's, it's exactly the same way as the town in Norway. They don't have their own light, they simply have a mirror that reflects that light. Jesus is the light of the world. Christians reflect His light. The moon, 
Does it have its light? The moon only reflects light from the sun. And Christians, according to the Bible, all of us of Jesus, we reflect that light. It's a treasure as though it's in jars of clay. We do it imperfectly. Our light is smaller. It's just a clay lamp. We do it imperfectly. But we just reflect the light. Even the language that Matthew uses, he's going to use the word false for light. That, by the way, I like this angle. This is an author who says that that's where we get our word for photograph. You know how Matthew would say it today? He would say, you, me, you are a photograph of Jesus. When people see you, they will see Jesus. They will see Jesus. But then Jesus says this. Jesus is going back to his point. You would not light a lamp and put it under a basket. You would not do that. That makes no point. Because just as putting it in a high place, some of your versions might say a candlestick, just like putting it in a candlestick, makes it so that the light can shine. Also, when you cover it, it no longer shines. Why is he telling this to the disciples? Why is he being so very specific about what light is? Here it is, here it is. It means that the followers of Jesus can cover their light. The followers of Jesus are the light of the world. You light, you shine everywhere you go, but we also cover our light. Okay, here's... Are you the light of the world in a restaurant when you've been waiting and waiting for service and nothing has happened? Are you the light of the world when you're on a helpline asking for technical information and it's been an hour? Are you still the light of the world? Or did you just cover it with the basket? Are you the light of the world when you are driving down Gates Avenue and no one's moving or someone cuts you off? Are you the light of the world when you are now smashing that horn? I see no one's answering, so everyone here is the light of the world. That's good. Here's, here's the point. We're going to just get this really granular. Light is visible all the time. Light is visible at work. Light is visible at home. I don't know if you know this, but um, what I hear from some young people what I've heard from some young people is, you should see my parents at church. They're amazing. This, by the way, this really speaks to me as a parent. But then you should see my parents at home. They're different. Are you the light of the world everywhere that you go? As, as, a, as a Christian, this is something we all say. As a Christian, when you're conducting business, is your main goal to get the best deal? Or is it to be the light of the world? As a Christian, as a, as a follower of Jesus, do we believe in a slash and burn practices where I go into the city, I get what I want, I do what I want, and then I'm out? That's not light. That's covering the light. You know, um, there's an author and he speaks and he says, Christians should be some of the most polite people, the biggest tippers, the people who go the extra mile, the people that people say, those people, they are different. Are you the light of the world at work? Are you the light of the world at home? You know, there's this, uh, in the beginning, the followers of Jesus were called Christians. If you wanted to be part of the church, it was called joining the way. That's what it was called. Until, until there's a turning point. It happens in Acts uh, chapter 11, 26. This is what it says. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Something was happening in the church of Antioch that made people call Christians, call them Christians. But it wasn't meant as a compliment. It was meant as an insult. See, the word, the word Christian in the Greek actually means little Christ's. Little Christ. So when they saw him, they said, you are like that other guy, like that crucified criminal. You little Christ's. 
Because everywhere that these Christians went, people saw Christ in them. And then in Antioch, in the church in Antioch, that's when the gospel explodes throughout the world. The moment that people see, oh, you're just like Christ. You're just like that. You're just like that. And then verses start coming after Antioch. Verses like, these are the ones that turn the world upside down. All these things start happening. When they shine, their lights everywhere that they go. By the way, uh, you are visible as a light. You are visible by a lot of different kind of people. You are visible by, by people who are far from God. People who have never opened the scriptures. People who have never heard the Bible, but like you are visible as a light where you go there. You are also visible to others who follow Jesus. We are also visible to the young ones that are growing up in this church. You are visible to every single person in your family. I have an author, Reggie Joyner, he says, no one, no one, no one on the planet will have more influence on a child than their parent. And he calculates that you have 3,000 hours with the child before they turn 18 years old and start making their own decisions. That is a sacred gift. That is 3,000 hours of shining light. By the way, we're not talking about some kind of uh, really good behavior you have to do. We're talking about a, a truthful experience, an authentic experience of what it means to follow Jesus. Because what power is it? What power is it when a child, when a young person can see the plan of redemption come to life in the life of an individual? I tell you, one of my one of my most treasured memories is walking down first thing in the morning and watching my parents uh, praying together. That is one of those memories. It's right here. It was one of the first things that told me this thing that we're doing, this thing that we're doing about following Jesus is real to them. And at the same time, I, I can tell you some occasions where, and I remember this, working at camp. I was working at summer camp. And I had a mentor with me who I really, really admired. And then in, this, and then in the next week I heard this mentor telling a crude joke. And I, like, I don't want to get into the details, but I want you to know is that that, that really rocked my world. I think I was 14 at the time. The thing is, your light is visible all the time. It can be such a powerful witness. There's Brendan Mann, and he has this, this great quote. It says, the greatest cause of atheism in the world is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips but walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. This is what the world simply finds unbelievable. And yet for every every experience when the light was covered. I can also start sharing with you uh, times when I saw the light of Jesus come alive in others, reflected in others. Can, can I tell you about the first time that I met a modern missionary? The first time that I met someone who had actually dedicated their life simply to tell other people about Jesus. That's right here. That's, that's a huge impact. Can I tell you about the first time that an adult spoke to me and, and shared with me their struggles as they attempted to follow Jesus. Can I tell you how much of a difference it made all of a sudden to hear that, oh, it's not just the saints, the perfect people. Oh, no, we're all on a journey. We are growing disciples of Jesus. Can I tell you how much of a difference I can make? Because we often think the opposite of hypocrisy is perfection. No. The opposite of hypocrisy is truthfulness. The opposite of being a hypocrite is telling the truth. And do you know what God is interested in? The truth. He's interested in a truthful relationship with you. And when people see this true, authentic experience, 
They are drawn to the light. By the way, God doesn't use perfect people. The scriptures is not a roll call of perfect people. It's a roll call of broken families, of broken jars of clay with the light shining through. Uh, there's an author, his name is Lee Strobel, and he tells the story of a woman, her name is Maggie, and she had grown up with no kind of biblical background, no, no, no church to say of. She doesn't even know how she started attending his church, but very, um, very shy at first with trepidation. She tells the story that after a couple of weeks, the church kept making announcements to join a small group. Join a small group. Join a small group. Very much like our church. Join a small group. So she took, she took the risk to join this small group. And uh, she remembers a, 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 attending the, the, the small group and all the questions. And she thought maybe all the eyes will be on me as I, as I join this, this small group. And she stayed silent for the first couple of sessions, but eventually uh, she began to speak in a small group. But she writes a letter to, to the pastor, to, to Pastor uh, Lee. And she says, I, I need to write you this letter because of the experiences that I'm having in your church. And Lee, as a pastor, goes, oh, oh no, oh, wait. Usually when a pastor gets a letter, and it's a little longer than a thank you note, well... So, so he gets the letter and, and he reads and he's reading about her experience and, and, he, and, he, and he understands that what he's reading is so important that she says, um, I'm not much of a writer, but I love poetry, so I've written this poem to kind of describe the experience that I've had with your church. So th this is the poem that she writes. She says, do you know, do you understand that you represent Jesus to me? Do you know, do you understand that when you treat me with gentleness, it raises the question in my mind that maybe he is gentle too. Do you know, do you understand that when you listen to my questions and you don't laugh, I think, what if Jesus is interested in me too? Do you know, do you understand that when I hear you talk about arguments and conflict and scars from your past, I think, hey, maybe I'm just a regular person instead of a bad, no good girl who deserves a if you care, I think maybe he cares. And then there's this flame of hope that burns inside of me. And for a while, I'm afraid to breathe because it might go out. Do you know, do you understand that your words are his words, your face, his face, to someone like me? Please be who you say you are. Please, God, don't let this be just a trick. Please let this be real. Please, do you know, do you understand that you represent Jesus to me? He immediately gets on the phone and he calls and he's like, I'm blown away by this. I, I've, I've never read someone just, that's what the gospel is. And she says, well, I have something to report. And, and the pastor braces again, ah, no. Ow, everyone was so nice. Okay, all right, what happened? What happened? She said, well, I have something to report. I've, I've given my heart to Jesus. I've given my heart to Jesus. And, and he's like, oh. Amazing, and he says, and, and, and please tell me, what argument convinced you, what, what piece of evidence told you that the Bible is true, that, that this could be trusted? And she says, it wasn't like that. I just met a bunch of people who were like Jesus to me. That's all it took. This isn't anything complicated that Jesus is talking about. He's saying, you are the light of the world. When you let your light shine, imperfectly, Truthfully, something begins to happen. He said that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Isn't it interesting that you don't start preaching first? That they may see your good works. It begins by the life that we live. It begins by the actions that we have. One of the leadership tests... Um, if you're, if you're doing a church plant, you're going to get someone to plant with you. And this is, <laughs> this is from a friend of mine. This is one of his tests he does. When he has somebody to, one of a co-leader come, he says, I don't actually care about your resume. Just give me your address. And he'll go and he'll ask the neighbors on the right, on the left, do you know this person? What kind of person are they? Oh. Oh. That speaks way louder than your theology than your belief system, than how well you can quote scriptures, 
is the things that we do, the kindness, the gentleness that we live in. And by the way, by the way, this church is inspirational in that. I can't tell you the many times that this church comes together to give rides to people, to help people in need, to reach out to It's too much. It's incredible. Because people won't care what you think until they know that you care about them. And Jesus ends with this. He says, let, let your light shine. Let your light shine. That translation, by the way, it seems passive to us. Let your light shine. Let, let there be cake. Let them come in. It sounds like you're, you're just allowing something to happen. You're just permitting something to happen. That's, that's not actually the language that Jesus says. That let, it used to mean something else a while back. It's actually a command. It's an imperative. A, a more accurate translation is more like, you must. You must. It is a command. This light. It must shine. It must, it, it must shine. It, it all depends on it. Uh, look, look at how Peter says it. First Peter 2 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That you may declare the praises. You've been called into this light to now declare the praises. There's a command there. Let your light shine. You must shine. Um, but Peter, Peter, Peter explains how to do this too. And it's almost exactly what Jesus is saying. First Peter 3.15 But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. People say, oh yes. You must be prepared. I am ready to preach on a notice. I am ready to tell people the truth. <laughs> Look what he says then. But do this with gentleness and respect. Oh. First, they will see your works and glorify your Father in heaven. And then when you speak, when you share, you do it with gentleness and respect. And gentleness and respect means you're aware of their contents. Yeah? You're aware of where they are in their journey. They've actually done a couple of studies um, where they analyze, I'm throwing myself right under the bus here, they analyze preachers on TV, okay? But they put them on mute, and they bring people just out of the street to, to analyze what emotions, how does the preacher feel as they go? Do you know what the most common emotion is? Without words, anger. Anger. People will write down, why is this guy so mad? Is he mad at me? That's the emotion that people take away. The thing is, you may be right, you may have the truth, but it really matters how you say it. Do it with gentleness and respect. And I want to end with this. This is, this is great. It says, he places the lamp on a lampstand. If this is us, I just want you to know that you are shining exactly where you are for a reason. You have been placed exactly where you are for a reason, so let your light shine. Even if your work situation uh, looks impossible or mundane or grueling, or if you're in school and you can't handle one more formula, one equation, you've been placed there by God to shine. As you're there with your family and you've got the five kids and you've got to wake them up and they barely just went to sleep, you have been placed there to shine. Let your light shine. Every one of us has been placed, and Jesus makes it really simple, light, is there a shine? Don't cover the light. Let it shine. And every single person that we see in this building today, and just look around. Look at that. Look at the people to the right, to the left. Go ahead, take 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 a look.
Take it in, take it in. You see them? You see them? Every, every, every single one of us, every single one of us, we owe our presence in this building to a light who is shining. Every single one of us. We owe it to, to a light through an imperfect vessel who showed you Jesus. You owe it to a kind conversation that you had with someone. It could have been your parent, it could have been a youth leader, it could have been a neighbor, but each one of us, we're only here because you saw the light through someone. And so I'm excited to tell you that you are the light of the world. We are the light of the world. For this time and place in history, God has called the Red Deer Seventh-day Adventist Church to be the light to Red Deer. And we want to be faithful to that call. And we're not always going to do it perfectly, but we don't want to be covering that light. We want to be able for people to see and say, who is that? They're just like Jesus. Because you are Jesus to them. We are Jesus to them. And Jesus was love. So that is my prayer for our church and our community. Let your light shine. Call the priest tomorrow.